Angel? I wandered so aimless, I filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger. today is Ephesians 4, 14 through 15, and it says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. So as we elaborate on that, <clears throat> I wanted to ask, is anyone hungry? Because I know sometimes it's hard to sit through church without a snack, so I thought I'd bring a little something along today. Are y'all hungry? All right. Who wants some, let's see, apples and spinach? Or maybe carrots and peas, maybe not. So what's the matter? Is there something wrong with, with these? You bet there is. This is baby food, isn't it? And you guys don't wanna eat this anymore because you're not babies. You're all grown up and you can eat grown up food. What's your favorite food? Is it maybe pizza? Hamburgers, those are mine. How about hot dogs or macaroni and cheese? I love all that stuff too, especially bread. I wonder though, do any of you like oysters? How about salad? Anyone eat, I don't know, Indian food? Japanese food? Some of you guys might grow into that food one day, but right now you've found your ideal menu, haven't you? You know something? This baby food reminds me of when I first became a Christian. The Bible says when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are born again. That makes you a baby Christian, doesn't it? 
And everyone knows a baby needs baby food. But there's something else we can learn from this baby food. We have to grow up sometime, don't we? Because you don't see your parents sitting down to a nice jar of strained peas, do you? <clears throat> That's why it's important that you don't stop learning about Jesus after you accept him as your savior. You need to study the Bible, spend time in prayer and Sunday school, and worship God. This is the spiritual food you'll need to grow up strong in the Lord. Just as real food helps your body grow. I want to challenge you guys. Don't get stuck in the baby food age. Seek God with all your heart. Because if you do, the Bible promises that you will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there in every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful and scheming ways. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will do all things, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Thank y'all for being with us today. Let's say a prayer. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for the opportunities you continually put in front of us. Help those. You know the needs. You know the craziness in the world today. Please be with each and every one and their families. Keep us all safe as you see fit. These things we ask in your name. Thank you for the birds of the moon. Amen. Today's scripture is from Acts 17, verses 22 to 28. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very re religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to do to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their anointed pointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that we would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not very far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sunday. As Paul comes cruising in to the city of Athens, he sees a lot of shrines, and the shrine that catches his attention is a shrine that says to an agnostic God. That's what those words mean in Greek, to an unknown God. This is probably what your Bible says, to an unknown God, and that word unknown is where we get our word agnostic. It means something that is not known, something that is forgotten, something that's not seen. And that is kind of the point of, I think, what Paul is talking about. The people are worshiping all kinds of things, all kinds of items, and all kinds of idols without seeing the one true God. Henry D. Lee, um, if you know that name, he made a really what might be considered a huge mistake one time, when he had his lucrative business selling kerosene, the primary fuel for people back in that day. And one day he was approached by a young man that wanted to buy out his business. And he offered a large amount of money, seemed fair, so Henry Lee took the money, 
and went on his, about his way. But the young man who bought him out happened to be John D. Rockefeller, who later turned that business into the gigantic corporation we know as Standard Oil. In 1911, federal um, court convicted Standard Oil of being a monopoly and broke it up into four additional companies, all of which became among the top 50 companies in the world, largest companies in the world, Exxon, Mobil, Amoco, and Chevron. So rather than uh, moan a bad decision, H.D. Lee moved on with his life and he started a business a year later called the H.D. Lee Mercantile Company. He sold groceries, hardware, and other supplies, but he grew tired of waiting for late shipments of work clothes. So he decided to make his own. And in 1913, he created some overalls that he called the Union All. And then later on, made some denim cowboy trousers that he called Lee Jeans. And for H.D. Lee, things turned out to be pretty decent. In a similar story, a man named John Lee and his partner were British chemists who um, sold surgical supplies. And in 1823, a friend of theirs asked them to reproduce a liquid he had found and used in India. So these two chemists got this liquid from Sir Marcus Sandys and tried to make a copy of it. When they tasted the concoction that they had made, it tasted awful. So it was put on a shelf and forgotten. But in 1825, John Lee was cleaning out his shop and he ran across that bottle of this old forgotten liquid and he opened it to discover that the flavor of it had changed. What had really at one time been really awful now was kind of tasty. Now, I don't know if I would be experimenting like that, but Sir Sandys took that aged version of the concoction to his country estate and served it to the guests and they all loved it. So Sir Marcus Sandys lived in Worcester, England. And because John Lee and his partner, William Perrins, decided to market the liquid, they called it Worcestershire sauce. And I can't believe I said it right on the first try. And they were famous. There was something going on here that these guys couldn't see. And that's kind of the point in this passage about Paul in Athens. There's a word here used in verse 27 that's not used anywhere else in the entire New Testament. It's the word that Paul uses to grope. That's probably what's in your Bible. It means to grope or to search, and it's a really interesting word. Paul uses it to describe searching for something, but mainly searching for God. But Homer is using that word much earlier to describe Cyclops in that great story, after he's blinded, there's something about that not being able to see. Remember that charcoal fire and John? John tosses that into the story in chapter 18 of his gospel. That little detail bothered me for so long. And when I learned at SMU that John doesn't write anything without purpose, it bothered me even more. Then I discovered, finally, a wise scholar who helped me see. Jesus was arrested by people with lanterns and torches, man-made lights. And when Jesus was being questioned, Peter moves closer and closer to another man-made light. It was that charcoal fire that Peter went to for warmth and comfort while the light of the world was on trial by the high priest. Then I realized a really great fact. Peter, though he walked with God daily, did not go to God for his help. Fear made him turn to human help, to human warmth. Peter was blind to who God really is. Now fast forward with me to Paul. He was a persecutor of the church until, that is, he saw Jesus. Remember what happened to Paul with his encounter with the risen Christ. Though his eyes were open, he couldn't see. 
He had to be guided around by the hand as one groping in the dark. Paul had always searched for God, spent his whole entire devoted life searching for God, and then found him and realized that he had never really known God at all. Fred Craddock did an Easter sermon one time on the Gospel of Mark and Mark's resurrection story. And he said there, the women went to the tomb, saw the angel, saw the empty tomb, heard the commission from the angels to go and tell the disciples that Jesus would meet them in Galilee. But all of this was too much for the women and in a very honest Greek way, Mark describes their reaction. And this is kind of what they really say, um, what Mark really says from the women. They did not say nothing to nobody. They ran. They were very, they were very afraid, they were fearful. The women could not say what they were asked to say. Paul in Athens does not have this problem. Notice in John, the very first thing that happens is testimony. John the Baptist is the very first person there we see, and John says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Andrew heard what John said and went to Peter and said, we have found the Messiah. The next day, Philip followed Jesus and then goes to Nathaniel and says, we have found him. How many of us are ready to say we have seen the Lord? How many of us are groping our way through the dark, searching for hope in all the wrong places? And most importantly, how many of us have truly seen the risen Christ and understood the power of God in this world and yet said nothing? How many of us look to other kinds of lights in this world to save us? How many of us are looking to all other sorts of things right now, but to one true God? Minnie Louise Haskins wrote a poem way back in 1908, and the poem was called God Knows. But a lot of people um, remember that uh, poem by a, a kind of a line in it, um, standing at the gate of the year. And I'm gonna read this quote from this line so it uh, makes sense. I think it's a great poem. It goes like this. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light so that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than a known light and safer than a known way. On that day, Paul told the people that God is with us and that God is in us constantly. And this is the best news for those of us who know it's true. When we started this year, 2020, who knew where we were headed? But putting our hand in the hand of God is still always the best choice, still always the best answer. Let's be that church, the church that trusts God, sees God, and tells what we've seen. Amen.